everyone and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Marina Ellsbury. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got our drinks in hand, so let's jump into some of the strange stories that have made headlines recently. (laughs) We believe that all news, good or bad, is better with a drink in hand. So Maureen, what are you drinking today? Today, I went a little on the wild side. I have made... I haven't tried it yet. Maybe I should try it before that I tell you. That looks fancy. Oh, it's actually quite good. Um, I made a dirty vodka martini with pickles and nice. using the alien, oh, sorry, outer space, not alien, vodka. It's shaped like so, an alien, so that works. But it is. I was about vodka. to say alien head vodka. Very cool. And you use pickles. That's amazing. And I should say this this was a gift from a viewer and also a friend, Eric. So thanks, Eric. We are enjoying our alien booze. Alien booze is always good booze. <laughs> yeah, what do you what do you we, got? We talked about alien booze on the last episode too. Where we oh. said we wished it it was alien booze, remember? It's too bad that's that we true. weren't drinking alien booze because that's it was the time key travel. To time travel. Booze. Yes. Well, today I am drinking a, uh, a concoction. Um, started um, infusing vodka. So this is vodka infused with with time travel with time travel juices from extraterrestrials. No, it's actually infused. It's making me very hungry because it's infused with basil and garlic. So oh, nice. It smells amazing, and it's actually quite good. On Thursday, December 14th, NASA held a press conference to announce the latest findings from its badass planet-hunting space-based telescope, Kepler. The press conference focused on an eighth planet discovered in a solar system approximately 2,500 light-years away from Earth. These planets circle a star called Kepler-90, and the latest planetary discovery means that solar system now ties ours for the highest number of planets around a single star. Exoplanet discoveries are pretty cool by themselves, and they happen pretty regularly now. Largely in part due to Kepler. But what makes the latest discovery even cooler is that it was detected by artificial intelligence. By teaming up with Google AI, NASA astronomers used machine learning to look for weak signals in Kepler's data. Paul Hurst, astrophysics division director at NASA, stated at the press conference... Kepler has already shown us that all other stars have planets, and now we know that other stars can have large solar systems like our own. Since its launch in 2009, more than 2,500 planets have been identified thanks to data collected by Kepler. There are sure to be many more discoveries waiting to be found in that mountain of data. And those discoveries will likely come much sooner now thanks to technology providing new scientific methods for scouring archival science data. Thanks, robots. On Wednesday, November 15th, an article titled, Airliners and F-15s Involved in Bizarre Encounter with Mystery Aircraft Over Oregon, was published on The War Zone, a section devoted to military, technology, strategy, and history on The Drive, a website owned by Time, Inc. This article's author, military and aviation correspondent Tyler Rogaway, tells the story of an incident that took place in October 2017. An unidentified craft was seen at approximately 4.30 p.m. on October 25th in the sky near the border of California and Oregon. The article points out an apparent witness account posted by a pilot to Reddit. This pilot states, Just landed in Seattle, coming from the Bay Area. Beginning over southern Oregon, we kept overhearing Seattle Center attempting to track an airplane with no transponder who wasn't talking. A handful of crews were able to track it visually, best they could tell it was between 35,000 and 37,000 feet, northbound. Nobody close enough to see the type. Last we heard, it was over the Willamette Valley, northbound, and some fighters, perhaps out of Portland International Airport, were scrambled to go take a peek. Center had trouble tracking it on primary radar. Strange. My theory is they were running drugs to Canada. No news yet. Not that I could find. 
The pilot followed up with an update stating, called Seattle Air Route Traffic Control Center. The gentleman I spoke with said that they initially got alerted to the aircraft from Oakland Center, who was painting it on primary, illuminating it with radar, but without transponder information. For whatever reason, they couldn't track it themselves on primary, and that's when I overheard them using airline aircraft to track it visually. The last airplane to see it had to descend into Portland and lost sight of it. The fighters were scrambled out of PDX, but flew around for a while and did not find it. And that's that. Audio from air traffic control seems to corroborate the story. Yes, sir. Uh, just going to give you a traffic call because there's kind of an unusual situation. Uh, traffic uh, potentially is through 1 o'clock, close to 1 o'clock and 4 zero miles off the direction. It's estimated between 350 and 370. Uh, they're not working at aircraft, and there's uh, two air pilots that have spotted it visually northbound between 350 and 370, approximately uh, between uh, Crater Lake or just west of Crater Lake area. All right, we'll keep an eye out, Scott's 3478. Scott's 3478, based on the last known position, they're potentially at your 1 to 2 o'clock in about 20 miles now. 3478. At Southwest uh, 4712. So we still have a visual on it. Uh, we'll call it uh, one or so, probably about 20 miles. That's 4712, maybe. Maybe 2 o'clock. LS 3478, maybe at your uh, 2 o'clock in about 15, 10 to 15 miles now. Yeah, I think I have it inside, Scott 3478. So 3478, you said you do have them inside? Yes. Okay, and if you can give me an estimate, uh, either on a type aircraft or uh, an altitude. Uh, looks about level with us, and I'm not able to see a type. The article's author, Tyler Rugaway, summarizes, The audio is fantastic, as it illustrates that there were many communications between various jet crews and Seattle Center, whose controllers tried to track the aircraft as it made its way north toward the Willamette Valley. The aircraft was not able to be tracked on radar, nor did it show up on crew's digital traffic collision avoidance systems. But it was clearly there, although never quite close enough to positively identify what its exact type was. Rogueway reached out to the 142nd Fighter Wing based at Portland International Airport, North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, and the FAA in an attempt to gain any additional information about this UFO. NORAD acknowledged this incident and did confirm that airliner pilots were asked to try to track and identify this white object that was traveling between 35,000 and 40,000 feet. NORAD also confirmed that F-15s from Portland were scrambled to investigate, but were unsuccessful in locating the mysterious craft. Rogaway, being a military aviation specialist, explains... The 142nd Fighter Wing operates F-15Cs upgraded with the most capable air-to-air radar set in the world and sniper advanced targeting pods for long-range visual identification. Their pilots are some of the best in the world and are highly trained in the Homeland Air Defense mission. The fact that they, quote, didn't find anything is surprising to say the least. The FAA also acknowledged the incident but provided no additional information. And... The 142nd Fighter Wing didn't respond at all to Rogaway's inquiry. Naturally, some believe this unidentified craft was top-secret military aircraft out of Beale Air Force Base in California. An unknown military aircraft should always be considered as an option when you're trying to identify unknown aerial crafts. It's a foregone conclusion that the military possesses technology that's unknown to the general public. But still, with this particular incident, we have several interesting points to consider. One, an unidentified white craft was seen by several pilots flying over Oregon. Two, fighter jets were scrambled to intercept and identify the unknown craft, but were unsuccessful in locating it. Three, the FAA and NORAD confirmed that the incident occurred. Four, the craft was large enough to be seen at a distance by commercial traffic. It reportedly traveled at an incredible approximate speed of 860 miles per hour. It had limited radar reflectivity and is capable of executing high G maneuvers. Again, it's certainly possible that this craft belongs to the military and NORAD, the Air Force, etc. aren't divulging the full story. But without confirmation of that and looking at all of the available evidence... And the interesting elements of this case, it leaves the door open to other possibilities. 
And now for our weird story. A man in Volgograd, Russia, claims he lived on Mars in a past life. On Monday, November 6th, the UK media outlet The Sun published a story with the title My Life on Mars. This genius Russian kid says he was born on Mars, and his parents believe him. This kid, now 21, is Boryshka Kiprianovich. This guy is allegedly highly intelligent. He reportedly began speaking when he was only a few months old, and he could read, draw, and paint at the young age of one and a half. Boryshka's mother said he talked about space and alien civilizations a lot as a child, and that's when he started claiming that he was born on Mars. Now, according to his claims, he was a Martian pilot who fought in a nuclear war that broke out on Mars, leaving only a few survivors who were forced to retreat underneath the planet's surface to construct underground cities. So how did Boryshka come to live on Earth? Well, he claims that when people died on Mars, their souls were stored in special stones. But one of those stones broke, and those souls found their way to Earth. Russian media outlet Pravda published stories on Boryshka in 2005. That caught the eye of Project Camelot, a production company focused on doing guerrilla-style interviews on alleged whistleblowers and others related to conspiracy theories, UFOs, and other strange phenomena. Project Camelot then went to Moscow and interviewed Boryshka in 2007. But that's been it. There hasn't really been any news or media coverage on this incredible guy since then. So, then why is this story back in the news all of a sudden? Countless media outlets from around the world published stories about Boryshka in November following The Sun's lead. But none of these stories offer any new information. They're all just rehashing information obtained by Project Camelot during the 2007 interview. Unfortunately, we see this pretty regularly with news stories. For one reason or another, old stories are published by one media outlet, then the story's picked up by other outlets, and then all of a sudden, we've got an old story that's new again. But speaking specifically about the Barishka story, I don't know about you, Maureen, but I don't really get why the story ever got media attention. I mean, there's just so much about the story that makes me think it's a whole lot of nothing. Nothing. It's crazy. It was it was a cold winter night in Moscow. No one had anything to do. They yeah. Were searching for evidence. No, um, you know, we often see this happen all the time and uh, really fantastical news stories that right away you'd think, why isn't this dismissed? Why is a media outlet publishing this? But it, but it's these sort of news outlets that are covering it, like The Sun, who look for that. They're looking specifically for that type of, uh, most of the general public would think it was completely crazy headline. Mm-hmm. It's going to get clicks. People yeah. are going to want to read that. So yeah, I, mean, I think it's... UK media outlets, you know, a lot of them are, are, are sensationalistic tabloids. That's what they are. So you're right, they seek right. that out. But it's fascinating because those same stories seem to find new life. You know, a few years down the road, they get uh, dug up by someone looking at stories and they publish it for really no seemingly new reason. There's nothing that happened to, you know, encourage or, or merit writing a new story it's just writing the same information that oh back in 2007 there was an interview with this guy mm-hmm. and we're that, a little hypocritical here because we are now covering this story well we're more covering the coverage of the story yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i mean lo- looking at the, the just the case by itself and and what it was and the the what kind of came out of the interview in, in 2007 I mean, it, it just, there's so many red flags with it that I don't know why anybody would continue believing it if you believe there was something there to begin with. I mean, first of all, you have a kid who, whose parents may or may not have encouraged this. I mean, what kid doesn't say, oh, I fly around in spaceships on Mars? Like, you know, kids say some rid- ridiculous things. But they, for some reason, believed him and encouraged it. And in the interview, even, like, they're filling in blanks for him to say, no, no, remember you said this. This is what you told us you did. This is what you did on Mars. This is why you said that. Just, you know, coaching him along the way. Um, he seems like a pretty normal normal kid, but getting some bad advice and bad encouragement, in my opinion. But a lot of conflicting things, he says, too, that people didn't really latch on to, like 
there was the war on Mars and almost everybody on Mars died. But he also says that, like, he can't die. He's immortal. But so, yet he's aging on Earth here. He's aging on Earth. Um, he's not worried about dying because he's immortal, but he already died, apparently, and all of his people on Mars died. So, I don't know. Really confusing. Really yeah. confusing. But it does have a little hint of, of interest to us in the fact that um, there are a lot of actual seemingly plausible theories that um, if maybe a natural disaster happened on Mars to uh, lead it to its current dusty red planet state, that life may have retreated to lava tubes underneath the planet's surface. That yes. has a lot more credence than um, this yes. child Martian pilot. And but. as you and I have talked about so many times before... Big fan of that, looking in lava tubes for life on Mars. That's where it is. Absolutely. Good, good it's got to be anywhere. Be. That's where it is. Yeah, that's right. Another thing that, that Borishka did, you know, like a lot of these supposed saviors or, you know, chosen alien people, extraterrestrial people who are here on Earth now to save humanity or whatever messages they bring, um, they have this whole savior complex, but they also um, make predictions. And Borishka was also a predictor. And he predicted that there would be a great flood that would really affect most of the Earth and wipe most everybody out, and and that didn't happen. I forget what year he uh, predicted that would happen, but it was years ago, and it uh, it never happened. Mm, okay, so. I thought you were trying to hint at like the Bible story of of Noah's Ark or something. <laughs> Well, no, it might have that been where, where he was getting it to. <laughs> but, Maybe there's some weird timeline yeah, happening there. <laughs> Maybe. Well, speaking about... No. Uh, no let's talk about our, our, our first story about, about Kepler. Kepler is uh, uh, you know, an instrument we've talked about so much on the show before. Big fans of Kepler on this show. Um, that really opened the door for exoplanets. It really... With, with the launch of Kepler and when that came online back in 2009... Um, that just opened the floodgates of discovering exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. And I know a lot of people think, so what? Who cares that there are planets out there? Aliens are here. Why do we care? Uh, I, I, I hear you. I hear you guys. But uh, this is exciting because it opens our eyes to just how big and awesome and, and, and filled with planets uh, the universe is. And all of these new discoveries, and now that we have machine learning aiding, and it's it's as creepy and scary and awesome as it is in Terminator. I mean, they literally used a neural net mm -hmm. to, you know, find these discrepancies, these discrepancies um, that human eyes overlooked in finding these new planets. So, good. I was going to say, I, th I think that th you make a good point there. It's this advent of machine learning and big data. And, you know, I'm in this uh, on my day to day work in this sphere for technology um, companies. And it's crazy how much these these new sort of processes we have and and the ways we can um, digest all this big data uh, and then learn from it. Yeah. And, and we can identify things we've never been able to identify before and we have companies like SETI using this and and I've seen them at tech conferences which is really cool mm. is you see that they're presenting this to non-space industries non um UFO or or yeah. anybody in the interest of this this is to engineers and uh it's kind of this really fascinating time because space industry is now adopting all of this to analyze all of this massive amounts of data we're getting. Here's where in the past, and still currently, we are doing a bit of crowdfunding. You yeah. know, we have SETI saying, hey, can you look on your computer and start running these numbers? If you see anything weird, let us know. But we also have now this system in place where the uh, process can help sift through this data at a credible rate of speed and construct sort of this big picture over time of what is happening and what's out there. What are these planets doing? Is there possibly life out there? It's amazing. Yeah, the whole process has just been completely transformed. You're right with uh, doing the, the crowdsourcing and now with machine learning. And this is an interesting angle to that because there are plenty of people out there who 
don't trust NASA. They think NASA, you know, hides information from us. They think that, you know, NASA knows about aliens and won't reveal it to us. Um, I think they doctor photos and doctor the results that uh, they release to the public. For those people, you know, machine learning has to, and, and using AI has to be a good thing too. For the same reason we talk about the private space industry and the, you know, these rich billionaires who are, just their interests are themselves and trying to make money because it's their business in addition to exploration and, and just learning about space it's more likely that they'll be the ones to discover extraterrestrial life and you know seemingly without the red tape and everything we'll be able to make an announcement to the public more easily and, and, and readily than, than NASA would for the people who think that NASA would for whatever reason keep that a secret but now you've got the robots and you think the robots are going to be on the side of, of NASA or some, or, or some secret government that doesn't want information out? No, we've got robots. Robots are going to be cool, and they're going to, they're going to tell us what's up. I like robots. Oh, I hope so. I'm, I'm still – sorry, you struck a nerve with me there with the um, latest press on the robot Sophia who wants to have children and talking about naming her kids. And I'm like, all I can think about – is all the movies, AI and the rest of the movies that uh, the robots then realize that they're being mistreated and come back and kill us. And that's a frightening thought. <laughs> I think it's inevitable. But uh, yeah. so, before so that it's happens, a little I hope we have a right good now. good run where robots are, are my buds because I like robots. So Yeah. Well, I do, I do think we're inching closer to the idea that all of this information that we're receiving from these different satellites um, – the stuff that, that can be separated from more classified military, you know, potential risk if that information is released to be open sourced. Yeah. And once that happens, then we'll have this big thing where everyone can work on this information. We do have that with the crowdfunding a little bit, but, but I'm looking at a grander scale mm -hmm. that hopefully that will happen soon. But um, let's, let's talk about outside of space we haven't had like a really strange pilot sighting um, that's unidentified like this for a while. This um, yeah, sighting of Oregon. Yeah, certainly not one that we've heard about in, in such detail and from so many pilots. You know, typically, you know, and, and people can debate this, but, uh, you know, we generally like to consider pilots as... as pretty good witnesses when it comes to UFO accounts because they spend their time in the air. They typically have a pretty good grasp on what things that are supposed to be in the sky look like. You know, that they're in the sky day in, day out, and night in, night out, I guess, um, flying around. So they're used to seeing planes coming from all directions, planes flying in different, uh, you know, w with the sun in different different areas of the sky, so different reflections, different things like that, different weather environments. Birds, now drones, um, blimps, all the stuff that's in the sky, they get a pretty good view of it as it should be at sky level. And so when there's something that's out of the ordinary to them, such as a craft that's flying considerably faster than it should or doing maneuvers that it that, uh, shouldn't be able to make, you know, that's pretty fascinating stuff. And it, it's hard to just dismiss it as, oh, they didn't know what they were seeing or it's just the jet running drugs to Canada. Um, you know, a lot of fascinating things with that case that make you say, well, it could be something interesting here. And looking at Reddit, you know, take Reddit for what it is, but people posting basically like on a message forum, and you can't verify who these people are and if their credentials are actually what they claim to be. But having so many people just chime in and say, yeah, you know, this isn't an unusual occurrence. This kind of stuff happens more often than you would think. And you and I certainly know that. We've heard from so many pilots over the years saying, yeah, this stuff happens a lot. We hear a lot of guys talking about incidents like this, but more times than not, nobody will get on the radio and talk about it or, or try to look into it because they're worried about their careers. They don't want to lose their jobs and say, oh, this guy's losing it because he's reporting something pretty bizarre that obviously isn't there because nothing you know stops and takes off at faster mm -hmm. than any jet we have like you have a lot of people who see this stuff and don't want to report it but here we have so many pilots and the audio is pretty cool too hearing them and just chiming in and saying yeah i see it now it's over here it's at this position it's pretty cool yeah and absolutely and and as somebody who now you know I finally returned from Spain. I'm back in the Pacific Northwest where this happened. I was not here, obviously. 
this area has a ton of history in terms of unidentified flying phenomena and um, in this area and some interesting conspiracies too that some have been recently alleged to maybe have been solved like db cooper's money you know uh, or or you have you know kenneth arnold sighting up in this area and uh if we go further north in alaska you know we've got all the foo fighters and everything else that were reported and recorded um that there's a ton of pilot sightings in this area um and and yet we don't really have any concrete answers for what any of this stuff has been um so this, I mean, this is a fresh sighting. Um, so maybe we'll see something develop. Maybe we'll uh, hear some more things. Maybe NORAD isn't telling us all they know. Right. Um, so it'll be interesting to follow up on. Of course, you know, it's it's quite plausible that uh, it was something to do with military sure. or um, something else. But maybe it's something unknown and right. not a drug runner. And here's the thing. I mean, I think even if nothing else comes of this, we don't hear any more about this case, which is most likely what will happen. Mm-hmm. I, I think the, the greatest possible thing that could come from this and more stories like it is just the visibility of it. Other pilots seeing, you know, things like that reported and, and you know, making a splash and, and making a new story and saying, huh, other people see this stuff too. And these guys, you know... We're happy to speak about it. Um, maybe it's okay to talk about this topic. Absolutely. And then, again, having the official recognition from NORAD that, yep, this is something we were alerted to. We were investigating, and um, it's a step in the right direction, if anything, right. I think. But, yeah, an added added bonus to this one that made it even more fascinating was the scrambling of fighter jets. And right. we certainly have other documented cases of that. So I encourage people to go go do some research, do some digging. There are documented cases of that. Just fascinating when you have you know pilot sightings paired with <laughs> combat planes being scrambled to intercept these things and failing at <laughs> even finding these things. It's kind of freaky, a little bit awesome, but mostly freaky. So you know things like that make you scratch your head and go, wow, maybe this is something that we should be taking a little more serious. <laughs> So, Jason, I'm excited because we have a special guest for our first interview of our new reboot, Um, a friend and a supporter of the show and someone we've known for for a few years now here, quite a few years, Oh yeah, uh, Bryce Sable. He was a CNN correspondent. He has um, Emmy Award winning television production experience. He's been a part of the Academy Awards and... Um, yeah, various he was the other CEO things. of the Academy, the, yeah. the Television Academy, the group that puts on the Emmys. So. Absolutely, and he's written quite a few books yeah. and just a stand-up guy. So we're really excited to have him join us today. So thanks so much for joining us, Bryce. Uh, Absolutely. Something cool, you were actually our second guest on Spacing Out ever. Oh, really? Technically, technically yeah. I think the first official guest Right? Because well, you I know think... how competitive I am, because if I was only the second, <laughs> then I'm a little worried about it. But if I was the first official, that's okay. good. Well, second I... episode, first guest. <laughs> I yeah. love that. That's that's yeah. a good splitting of the difference. So that's exactly. very good. So that's perfect, because <laughs> you know, you, you've know you been on Spacing Out uh, several times now. But again, you are number one since our rebooting the show. So yes. I, I think it's fitting. Oh. Every, well, actually, you know, I love to be part of any good reboot. You know that. I'm a <laughs> you know Hollywood that? guy. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So we usually have you on for a bit different reason. We usually talk to you strictly about nonfiction UFO topics. But now you've jumped into the realm of alternative fiction. And this one's on The Beatles. And your latest book came out, was it December 5th? Yes, just last uh, yeah. week, my time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so we have this, this awesome book. Uh, once there was a way, what if the Beatles stayed together? And it's the whole idea of what if John Lennon didn't die and the Beatles kept going as a band? Uh, right. How did you even come up with getting involved in this topic? Well, I kind of fell into alternate history 
actually, if you think about it, you're talking about UFOs, going back to the 90s when I had Dark Skies on NBC, which if you really want to define it, it is an alternate history. It's basically a history saying that Kennedy was assassinated because he was going to tell the truth about UFOs in his second term. So that was an alternate history. And then a few years ago, I sort of went down the rabbit hole entirely. I'm a fiction writer. I happen to talk about the things that I write about in a nonfiction way, uh, as the UFOs uh, example points out. But what I, what I did a few years ago is I just went all the way with the with oh I went all the way with JFK. I said I my first book was called Surrounded by Enemies: What if Kennedy Survived Dallas? And I thought it would be a one-off, but it, it won the Sidewise Award for Alternate History, which is kind of a big deal. I mean, Philip Roth has won it, so I was very happy to have won it. And it got a book publisher saying, you know, you should do this again. What would you do for a second book? Uh, that was Diversion Books. And I figured if you're going to do the icons of the counterculture, you've got JFK. Now you need to go with what else? The Beatles. And I thought it was a really compelling uh, what if. Uh, because so many people uh, really don't know the Beatles at all, other than this really older rock and roll group, uh, the best ever probably. But if you think about it, the Beatles were contemporaries of the Rolling Stones. And the Rolling Stones were happening at the same exact time as the Beatles and uh, and and were competitors, really, friends and competitors. And who's uh, one of the top bands in the world right now but the Rolling Stones? So it's not impossible to be talking about the Beatles and asking what could have happened if they could have worked it out instead of let it be. And so that's really what Once There Was A Way is all about, trying to ask the question, what could have happened differently? What breakpoint might have occurred in history that would have allowed the Beatles to find a way to continue to play together? And it isn't just about John Lennon surviving. John Lennon actually does survive in the book. I don't think that's a spoiler of, of any kind, if you're going to have the Beatles continue to play together. But I start the, the book far back. I start it back while they're still the Beatles in 1968, find some of those little things that could have been happening even as they were starting to fracture in our timeline and try to keep them together. And uh, so far, I think uh, the people that have been, uh, you know, getting a chance to look at the book feel that way. They feel like that it's kind of a fun book to read. And it, and in a time where Trump and, and uh, the news makes everybody a little on edge, here's a book that makes people feel pretty good. Absolutely. And I would say uh, when I was reading it that it's a bit almost Dan Brown-esque where you have all these little portions of real places, real yes. albums, real history, uh, bits and pieces of things that did happen with a slight twist. And right. I, I think that's like the really interesting thing, especially if you're a Beatles fan, that you'll recognize some of these aspects and, and say, oh, man. And it's, uh, you know, drives you to read further into it. Mm. But if you're not a Beatles fan, it's still interesting. And there's a lot of drama Um Obviously, I don't want to give a lot of right. spoilers away, oh, but we can talk but, about anything. But yeah, sure. you know, the FBI connection, like, sure, which we do know uh, happened is is Lenin was targeted by the FBI. Uh, you know, surveillance happened all the time. Uh, what if that was a bigger aspect? So um, I or a different I aspect I'm, in a way, know, though, just to follow up that thought. Yes. In our timeline, uh, in the 70s, John Lennon was living in the United States, and, and he became a, a target of the Nixon administration. He was put on the enemies list that John uh, Dean testified to Congress about. And uh, Lennon saw that as kind of a badge of honor, uh, that he was uh, had alienated the Nixon administration, and they had turned both the FBI and the INS loose on him. But you, you're you're right about how once there was a way would take something like that that's embedded in our own real reality in our timeline and twist it. And th my thinking would be, uh, if the Beatles had stayed together, Lennon would still have be, been a radical uh, uh, political force, would still have probably been in the United States, would still have probably pissed off the Nixon administration. But the difference would have been the Nixon administration would have been seeing him as the leader of the Beatles. And so uh, rather than getting Lennon off the hook, it probably would have gotten McCartney and Harrison and Starr on the hook, that they would have been guilty by association in the eyes of Nixon. And so that's one of those great examples where everything in the book feels very real. 
which is the thing that I tried. I've tried to do that in all these alternate histories. To there's no time travel in my alternate histories. There's no magic. There's no none of that. It just sort of takes the place where history starts to divert and tries to make it as real as possible. Because I think, particularly when you're writing for people who are Beatles fans, these people know their stuff. And so the greatest reward you can give a Beatles fan is to say, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by making up stuff that's just out of whole cloth and crazy. I'm going to I'm going to take the stuff that you already know and bend it and twist it and shape it into something else. And, uh, you know, it's been uh, quite a long time since the Beatles played together. So what this allows us to do is to have new adventures for the Beatles. And if you think about it. We have a number of great characters in literature and history. Uh, Captain Kirk happens to be a great character who now has been played by several people. What about Batman? Uh, what about Hamlet? You know, people play these characters and the characters are enriched by it. I don't know why the Beatles can't have the same uh, uh, enrichment. They're wonderful characters. Who among us doesn't know the difference between John, Paul, George, and Ringo? Who doesn't know something about the personality types they represent? So all I've really done is taken those four personality types and wound them into a wholly different story, and yet they're still themselves. They still behave as you would expect them to behave, but now they're behaving to different stimuli. So it's been really fun to, to write it and to talk to people about it. It sounds like this book, Bryce, would uh, make quite a fun movie. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> nobody actually, as you know, nobody in publishing except for Dan Brown and Stephen King and, and uh, J.K. Rowling actually get rich off the publishing industry these days. What I'm a television and a feature writer primarily, not a, not a book author, although now I do consider myself a book author. But if, if uh, you know, what I do is I, I write things that are filmed. And, and produced. So what I did with the, the Breakpoint series, which includes Surrounded by Enemies, the JFK book, and now Once There Was a Way, which is the Beatles book, is I've tried to create my own intellectual property, my own underlying rights that I don't have to go to somebody every two years and re-up the option on. This is my option. I own it. So I can do what I want with it. Uh, the only thing I would say is I'd be, I'd be very happy, of course, to write a movie about Once There Was a Way. It'd be a fantastic film, but I think it might find its expression in a better way as a miniseries or a series. That Breakpoint is sort of the uber uh, large series name, uh, much in the way that maybe American Horror Story uh, is, mm. is sort of the uber thing, but then each season is a different what if. Yeah. So one season might be Kennedy Lives, one season might be The Beatles continue to play and god knows what the other seasons will be but i guarantee there's plenty of great ones out there to do and once people sort of get the hang of it after that first season i think that they'll be really enjoying this alternate history and and uh, hopefully they'll enjoy watching it as much as i've enjoyed writing it absolutely that is a fantastic idea <laughs> i would yeah. definitely watch it I out can't of curiosity wait. do you have a uh, an actor that you would peg for mm -hmm. john lennon well, young it's, it's, John Lennon or old. <laughs> well, it's it's that that's a really excellent uh, point. Uh, the Beatles in our minds are these young men who were part of Beatlemania, and literally they broke up just as they were all turning thirty. Okay, so uh, if you think about it, the series uh, or the movie or whatever the expression would be would be men in their thirties, right? So. Uh, for the first time, instead of hiring older actors and trying to pawn them off as these youthful Beatles, uh, I would be able to hire actors and let them either play their age or, or age them up. The book itself focuses on those years of what I call the years of maximum danger to the, to the Beatles. So that would be from 1968 in, in the book through 1975. Uh, although they continue to play together as the book goes forward. So these would be older men. So the question is, who, who would be those people? I have learned one thing, uh, I think, in, in my producing, which is uh, names are great, but performance is better. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though there are names that we could play around with uh, that it would be fascinating, uh, the question is, are they available? Can they sing? And can they act? Yeah. Because what I what I think you want to do with Once There Was a Way as a miniseries is you want to get four people uh, in their 30s who uh, can act like crazy, but can also sing 
and can sing together because what you would be doing in a movie or a, or a miniseries is you would be taking these four people and you would be portraying them as the Beatles. But what songs would be, they be singing? They'd be singing songs like Photograph, Imagine, Band on the Run, All Things Must Pass, the songs that you guys and your, your viewers and listeners know as solo songs would now be recorded by the Beatles in this in this miniseries. And I just think that would be really fun. So I've, I've gone a long ways around, and I haven't answered your question because I almost haven't allowed myself that thought. You, you sort of want to sell it before you cast it. So I guess I'm superstitious that way. Sure, and uh, I respect that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, speaking of these danger years, let's talk yeah. about uh, 1974. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Well, I, I, listen, uh, the one thing I will tell you, uh, the, you can't evade who you are and who I am is a guy that's been, uh, trained in writing television drama, our drama, where there's some really strong rules and where you have to really catch that wave of drama and it has to increase and increase till it's, it just breaks apart. And then you kind of put it together after that. So even though I love the book and the way that it, it sort of arcs itself out, as you get toward those final years, you really got to up the stakes. And so what I've tried to do, uh, and, you know, I guess some people may look at this as a spoiler. So those people, and I hate to tell anyone not to listen to your, your show, but if they don't want a spoiler, then they should probably not listen right now. Because what, what, I, what I have always tried to do with these what ifs is to, no matter how outrageous they are, they have to have something that embeds them in a real event. So what do we really know about 1974? We know that the world felt like it was falling apart. I mean, Nixon resigns uh, and and Patty Hearst gets kidnapped. And uh, for those of your uh, listeners, viewers who who don't remember Patty Hearst, she was uh, the the great or the granddaughter of the Hearst fortune. She was kidnapped out of her apartment in Berkeley in 1974 and became a bank robber with the Symbionese Liberation Army. She was on the FBI's top of the most wanted list. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, the, the connection between kidnapping and political action. That as particularly in 1974, these these groups were becoming more desperate. Uh, because, first of all, they'd been bombing things and the FBI was after them. But second of all, the Vietnam War was winding down. So the very thing that provided the energy to them was going away. And so what they had to do is they said, we got to do something that will get us back in the newspaper. So they kidnapped Patty Hearst. So I thought, that's good. I'll try to do that. Well, what was happening in 1973 and 74 in the lives of our four Beatles well, what was happening included John Lennon being banished by Yoko Ono uh, out of New York and out of their Dakota apartment and moving to Los Angeles, where he proceeded to get drunk with friends and party excessively. And he made himself kind of a visible target. And so what I've done in 1974 is I've taken the Patty Hearst page and applied it to the John Lennon story. I won't spoil any more than that, other than to say it kicks the intensity up of the of the picture a lot, and and it also allows all these other great characters, Paul and Yoko in particular. Suddenly, these two people who haven't been the best friends have something they need to work on together, mm -hmm. and and it really tests people uh, when when you're uh, when the crucible of danger is applied to someone you mutually care about then you're going to have to figure out ways to work together. And so that happens too. So yes, 1974 is a huge year in the life of the reconstituted Beatles. And it also goes to prove that this isn't just sweetness and light. This isn't just champagne and cookies, you know, for, for a few years. The, the Beatles would have had substantial issues and problems trying to stay together as a group. They couldn't have done it without a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, problems. And they also would have drawn more attention to themselves by staying together because they would no longer have been the four guys out trying to survive out in the world and, and stay, uh, you know, sort of stay out of the public eye. They would have by, been by their very nature then in the public eye. So it gets pretty crazy. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's fun. But by removing and, and I, Lenin from New York yeah. in 74, you lose his UFO sighting. Yeah, that's what I was well, going to bring no, up. Well, no, actually, that's not true. Okay. Uh, let, let's, Lennon in 1974 
came back to New York in our timeline. Okay. We're talking about the the timeline that we're talking about the real our historical timeline. Okay. It is true that John Lennon came back to New York. He didn't reunite with Yoko immediately. He did want to, but he didn't. And he came back. He was living in New York in 74 with uh, May Pang, uh, his assistant that he had gone to Los Angeles with. And you're so right. I mean, the connection between the Beatles and some of the things we've talked about in the past is that John Lennon, uh, unique among all four of the Beatles, had a UFO sighting and an up close and personal one. He saw a UFO which, as as I've heard it described, sort of sounds like one of those colorful spinning top kind of UFOs. Mm -hmm. He and May Pang both saw it. They both went out on the, the veranda and looked at it for quite a while uh, and up close, and then it, it took off. And Lennon talked openly about this. And people say, well, then, you know, I'm surprised. Why haven't I heard more about it? And why didn't people do something about it? Well, first of all, he was John Lennon. Second of all, he was naked when he saw the UFO. And third of all, people knew that his history of drugs. So the people that didn't want it to amount to anything, it was easy for them to say, well, it's John Lennon. What do you expect? So, yes, very good call. Very good call. And you may have been, uh, Maureen, you may have been talking about the Lenin sighting, and I went off on the whole revolutionary thing. But I think it it's, all part of, it's all part of the same thing. Yeah. And, and, and in reality, though, um, there's no, that's the kind of thing that um, I think could easily have happened in either alternative. I mean, Lenin could have found himself in New York in both cases. And uh, actually, he's kind of does in the book. So it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I, I, I was almost surprised a little bit just because of, right. of how we've known you forever that um, his tangent in the UFO world didn't go off on this other direction. And all of a sudden you see John Lennon at <laughs> UFO conferences or speaking about his sightings or, you well, know, you know what? Here's the thing. I've You guys have experienced this as much as I have. Most people have never heard about this. And second of all, Lennon himself didn't really follow up. Uh, too much. I mean, in the immediate aftermath, he talked to people about it. He even wrote that song, you know, Strange Days Indeed. There's UFOs over New York. Yeah. So, I mean, he he wasn't afraid to say it, which is what I love about him. I mean, I have a, a quote that I uh, is on my wall. It's not on this wall, so I can't read it to you, but it's Lennon talking about what it would mean to disclose UFO reality, which is something I'm, I, I talk a lot about. It's why we talked in the first place right. because of that first book, AD After Disclosure, that I wrote with Richard Dolan. And I think that Lennon certainly uh, was not intimidated. He wasn't worried people were going to think he was weird. He, they already thought that. So what did he have to lose? And uh, God bless him because he, he said, uh, once uh, you tell people what's really going on, their petty little lie, their lives are going to seem petty in comparison, and it's going to bring radical revolutionary change to society. And I think he was ahead of his time in saying that. And it's, he probably encapsulated in that statement that he made uh, the very reason why we're still in 2017 going into 2018 arguing about when disclosure will happen, because it is so controversial. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, now I... I w Thinking about you, this book, and, and just who you are in your background, I, I think this sounds more better suited for a television show. So I'm going to yeah. keep my fingers crossed, okay. buddy, that Thank uh, you. something TV <laughs> happens with this because this would make a fantastic series. It would, and 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 in fact, um, it will be a series with one incredible soundtrack, which yes. I, I think is. I mean, it, what it is in a way, it's it's like. It's so much better than the Monkees, which were a fake group. It's like keeping the Beatles together, yeah. but casting uh, people that can sing and, and act uh, to portray these new storylines. Because, um, you know, you think about it. 1970 comes. They walk away from it. Yeah, they create four different rivulets in their own time frame. But ne none of them are as compelling as what the Beatles would have been had they continued to stay together. And so that's what I've tried to do. And by the way, uh, I don't, uh, you know, not to uh, promote too heavily here, but I do think people might be interested that there is a website that we built that has a lot of Easter eggs in it for people uh, who want to see a little bit more about how this this Beatles thing plays out maybe before they even buy the book. I, it doesn't really matter. It works both ways. But that's called whatifbeatles.com. 
And uh, that's just a chance to see some of the albums that could have been recorded, to hear some of that kind of stuff. And if people want to buy it, of course, they can get it from uh, – I, I actually bought the I – I didn't even know you could do this, but I bought the URL AmazonBeatles.com. And the police did not come knocking at my door and take it away from me. So I'm still using AmazonBeatles.com, and that's a pretty good way to get the book. Awesome. And people still have time to get the book before Christmas. Yes, which is I, – I thought all along that uh, once there was a way she could be – the, the perfect uh, Christmas gift for the Beatles fan who has everything because they don't have this. I mean, mm -hmm. I wrote something that I wanted to read. And since I couldn't find anyone who had written it the way I wanted to read it, I had to write it myself. And what's, uh, you know, what is interesting is here is a, um, a, a book that it's a, it's a slim little volume, but it's packed with a lot of good stuff. But what's interesting is that here's a, a book that people, can literally get shipped to them uh, and, and get it for Christmas. But imagine that you're in that secret Santa uh, thing at the office. And what do they always tell the secret Santas? Don't spend more than $25 or don't spend <laughs> more than $20. So I, I thought, well, that's great. I'll write a Beatles book that they can get for, for a, a really cheap price. And they can give it as secret Santas because everyone knows Bob at work is a huge Beatles fan or whatever. So that's what I've tried to do. And, and I think... Uh, I, I thank you for bringing that up because the truth is, it it is a, it, it's the kind of thing, you know what? After all the presents are unwrapped and people are like having Christmas fatigue, they either want to go play their games or you know whatever they're going to do. This is a good one to to go grab a couple hours with because it does take you to a different place and it does to a different time and it does let you experience the Beatles who, you wish you heard some new stories from them and now you can. Definitely. Absolutely. All right. And we're super excited about this yeah. latest project of yours, but you've done so much more aside from the Beatles yes. prior to the Beatles. So where can people go to find out about your other works? Well, uh, I uh, maintain a, a professional uh, site called stellar productions, not today, uh, which is pretty easy to get to. Uh, and a couple of big things going on right now. One of them is there's a feature film uh, that uh, my wife and I are producing with uh, the people at uh, the picture company is the is the producer uh, entity in town. And it's for Studio Canal and it will shoot next spring. It's called The Last Battle. And it is literally about the last battle of World War II in Europe. It's a true story. People are blown away by it. And it only took us years and years to get it made, but it's going to be made next year and it'll be a big, expensive studio film. So we like that. Uh, from the UFO point of view, though, um, we've also um, optioned uh, the Kathy Marden and Stanton Friedman book, Captured. And have been developing that for a few years and are, are starting to make some significant progress that makes me feel uh, that that's, you know, maybe it's time has come given where the country is and it's the fact that it's this interracial romance set against uh, the UFO storyline. Yeah. And then finally, we also have the rights to uh, Don Schmidt's Witness to Roswell and Stanton Friedman's Top Secret Magic that uh, we were calling that project Magic Men. But then I found that unless I spelled it for people and literally held up the spelling, <laughs> uh, people would go, so they do magic. I don't, right. so <laughs> we, we, I figured like you guys know what, what magic I'm talking about, but most people don't. So we've changed that to unidentified. And again, as the year closes out and the new year gets ready to rev up, we have some significant progress on that. So those are a couple of things that I'm excited by. And then actually it's like, sometimes you just say, how does all this happen at once? But uh, I had a director call me last year and say, I really loved that movie you did for the Sci-Fi Channel, Official Denial, which was so long ago I've forgotten the year, but it was the first original film for the Sci-Fi Channel, and it was about alien abductions. And I loved that film dearly, but you know, I, I sold it to them, and they made a cheap version of it that I liked the script better than the film mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and as it turns out, my wife called the WGA and they said, no, they didn't uh, actually pay for the uh, the film rights. Mm -hmm. They just bought the TV rights. So you actually can make a film out of that. Wow. So this director, Sylvain White, and I are, are working on that as well. So hopefully uh, there'll be new UFO material out there as well. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah you are yeah. crazy busy, but it sounds like busy with fun stuff. I, You know what? If... Uh, 
if they're, yeah, it's it, this is the most fun. It's it's really great to bring bring life to things that just turn you on. Yeah. Um, the the Beatles idea uh, obviously was one of those where I just thought people aren't going to be clamoring for me to reinvent the Beatles. I have to show them. That's why I had to write it first. I had to show people what it can be and let them judge it for themselves. And that's that's exactly what I'm doing. But it is fun. Very. Well, we always awesome. love having you join us, Bryce. Thank you Thank so you. much for hanging out with us again. And congratulations again on the book. All right, guys. See you later. Right. Bye-bye. Take care. Well, that is all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit our website. That's rogueplanet.tv for all sorts of UFO and other strange related news. And you can follow us on Twitter at rogueplanethq. We've also recently launched a Facebook group, Rogue Planet TV, and this is going to be the best place where you can interact with us. We're going to be posting stories and links related to each episode that you can comment on and share your ideas. You can also feel free to post interesting stories there as well. If you liked today's episode, please make sure to hit the like button on YouTube and leave us your comments. You can also check out our podcast, Unknown, at rogueplanet.tv slash unknown, or download it on iTunes. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future. <laughs>